So let me see if I can summarize this. Man is spiritually dead. He inherits his condition at conception. This is a universal condition. This is, in fact, uh, why it's one of the basic reasons Christ had to come and be born to a virgin. What's so significant about the virgin birth? We would say it's because he did not inherit a fallen nature from his parents. He was born of the Spirit in the womb of Mary. We would say that on his own, man does not seek after God, nor is he even able to do so. As such, apart from grace, we are all children of God's wrath. We would all be so if it were not for his intervention. Without a choice of God by his will, not a choice of man's will, but without God's taking a choice and making a move, we would still be objects of wrath. Our hearts are desperately wicked. We cannot change our own spots. We can merit nothing before God. And apart from God's spirit, we can't understand spiritual things. We cannot understand the gospel. This puts us in a horrendous situation. The scripture tells the bad news before it gets to the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. What is that good news? How then can a person be saved? And this is where Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 comes in. And it's such a clear statement of this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing, your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Beforehand, God has done this preparation. He is not something that we are able to do, but he does. He brings us true salvation. So the children of God are actuated by the Spirit of God to do what needs to be done. They are drawn by the Holy Spirit out of an unwilling state to be made willing. God, in fact, has a divine change of our nature and our will. In rebirth. That's what we call in terms of regeneration. It is the remaking of our old nature. Uh, since the fall, it's owing only to grace of God that man draws near to God, that God, that we call out to him, that we put our faith in him. We know that no good thing which is our own can be found in our old will. And by the magnitude of the very first sin, we lost the freedom of the will to believe in God and live holy lives. And, and therefore, as Romans 9 says, it depends not on the human will, not on human will uh, or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Romans 9 we'll get to again, of course. This is a central passage on the topic. Now, it's not because we ought not to will. It's not that we are not called to exert our spiritual uh, thought and energy. We are, in fact, called to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. As you know, it says in Philippians, we are to work out our salvation. Now, how do you do that as one who's done? Because it says in the immediately following sentence, it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So work out your salvation because it's God who works in you both to will and to work. Both to will and to work. You have to will. How could you do that unless God helps your will to do so? And that's what the scripture says there. Now, I said I would get back to prayer. And this is how Christians pray for one another, isn't it? Indeed, the church universally sends up prayers to God for his intervention in the lives and the hearts of certain people who, at this point, in, as far as we can tell, have they've rejected Christ or don't believe in him. We say, Lord, please bring this individual to faith. In effect, we're praying, Lord, intervene. Lord, change their will. Give them a new nature so that they have an ability. To, to Obviously, what's going on right now in their heart is they don't have an ability to turn their hearts to you. This is exactly the right prayer to pray. God, who is sovereign, God, the creator, who breathed life into us in the first place, can give us rebirth. Tom prays that right alongside Sharon. But Tom is praying as if he believed God would do so as if he would change it, as if he could change man's will. Now, I'm a very visual person, and so a lot of talk up here and, and some words, but let me see if I can draw a graphic illustration uh, for us of these two positions. And again, I'm going to represent both of them here, and we'll compare. Let's look at Tom's position here, and what we have in the picture is a big pit. We have a pit in which all men are cast apart from Christ, and I'm representing now the, the free will position of Tom. In this position... 
All men are cast apart from Christ into the pit. We would all agree about that. Uh, There is no hope of heaven or eternal life apart from Christ. We would say that there is spiritual death for those in the pit. In that sense, the Arminian would say they are dead in their trespasses and sins. God intervenes in the Arminian's position in the sense that he sends Christ to live and to die so that all mankind universally might have the opportunity to be saved. It's as if he puts a ladder of the cross down into the pit. And this is where free will kicks in. Uh, In this view, all men have the freedom, they have the ability to choose Christ, and it's only those who exercise their will to choose Christ that are able to climb out via the ladder of faith. That, I think, and I can be corrected here, but I think that's the position of Arminianism. Predestination. Let's look at at, uh, Sharon's position. In this position, you have the same pit of death apart from Christ, and yet in the picture, the dead are dead. Not merely in their separation from Christ, but in their ability to will or to do anything that benefits them spiritually. There are none that seek God, you see. Apart from Christ, they are not able to overcome their fallen natures and thus are inclined only to evil. They're only inclined to rebellion against God. Apart from grace, they are all condemned to hell. In his grace, however, and this is the remarkable thing, in his grace, God elects some to eternal life, passing over others. It's in these chosen that God begins a good work by sending his regenerating spirit, bringing them new birth. They have a new life. They are regenerated to the point, say, of in the position that Adam was again. They now have the old nature, which still battles in their heart, but they still have now given a new heart like Adam. He can choose both good and evil. Uh, So they're given a new heart of flesh, and their will then responds, not as a puppet does, but as those newly enabled to will to do what is right. It's only by grace that they're enabled to do that. But, of course, the avenue that God has chosen, the means that he has chosen, is that they would respond in faith. And that faith itself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In this scenario, Jesus not only makes salvation a possibility, which is the Arminian position, but, in fact, he actually does the saving. I just want to throw in a little pitch here that Jesus' name means he saves. It doesn't mean that he makes salvation a possibility. But he saves. He actually does the saving. Those elect have chosen of God are given to Jesus as his own. The Father gives the elect to the Son, and none of them will be lost. I keep them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, he said, Jesus said. Uh, every last one of the elect come to faith and are saved. The, the language is, is phenomenal. If you follow through the scripture, this is in Acts chapter 13. As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. You see, those predestined unto life, God, those he has chosen, those he sends his Holy Spirit to do the work in their heart to believe, all of them believe. All of them come to life. Now, the hardest part of the Bible's teaching on election, I think, that we have to wrestle with is that God passes over some, and he saved others. And that's admittedly hard for us to imagine. But in truth, unless you're a universalist, unless you believe that God saves every human who ever lived, you already believe this. We don't believe that every person ever created will be in heaven. The Bible speaks of a separation of the sheep from the goats, The sheep going to eternal joy in the presence of God and the rest cast into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you find by God's grace and an awakening in a sense that you are one of his chosen people, you don't see that as a pride-filled thing, something to boast about. You see, we weren't allowed to boast because it's not of our works. This is a gift of God. If you find that, you also reap some phenomenal benefits. For example... The assurance that if God began a good work in you, he will complete it until the day of salvation. There's the assurance one gains of salvation. But we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Whether you believe man retains an innate ability of will to choose God or that God first enables fallen man's will, you still are left with those who reject Christ suffering eternity in hell. 
Either way, God allows this to happen. And we may not like it. It's very hard for us to get our heads around. But it is what the scripture says. The point that Sharon would have Tom understand, though, is that because of man's fallen nature and thus his rebellious heart against God, all of mankind, all of them, is under God's wrath and deserve judgment. All of them would start off that way. If the wages of sin is death, every one of us has earned our wages. Then we, we all are in that condition. We personally own God's wrath against us, even every one of us. But what this does, it makes God's electing of some to experience eternal life in his presence an awesome thing. In a new way, perhaps, for you. Romans 9, which speaks of us as being objects of wrath before God, after he talks and explains the gospel, speaks of those same people as being objects of God's mercy. And when those people come to an understanding that they have been rescued by Christ, they have a, gr a greater grasp of his grace and his mercy. Grace is seen for what it truly is. It's an act of God's favor, completely undeserved. Not that God looked down into the future and saw that we were going to believe and put, uh, he chose those people. But in fact, he chooses us unconditionally. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now that verse is a wonderful verse for Tom and those like him in the Arminian position. But for the Sharons of the world, it makes God's grace come alive in a remarkably new way, a more profound way. He saved us when we were dead in our sins. He initiated our redemption and not only made it a wishful possibility, but actually he accomplished it in my life. He made it certain. His atoning sacrifice was not only made available for those who would reach out and could grab it on their own, but realizing that no one with that hardened heart against God, that stony heart, ever would reach out and grab it, he gave us a new heart. And he reached down into the depth of the pit and he breathed life into us again. And so we have Jesus sent by the Father to actually save sinners. This is the, the meaning of the, of the talk that goes on between Nicodemus and Jesus in John chapter 3, that passage that eventually brings about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that those who believe in him are not perishing, but having everlasting life. Nicodemus is wrestling with how this happens, and he's asking, what can I do? And Jesus says to him about this new birth, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Well, Nicodemus knew, as you and I do, that we're not, we don't bring about our own birth. I mean, I can't make myself be born. And so he asks the question, how can a man be born when he's old? And Jesus then makes the key point that man cannot enter the kingdom unless there is initiative of someone else, of God himself. It's not of his own initiative. New spiritual life, new physical uh, birth. It's like physical birth. It's somewhere that we are acted upon. <laughs> we are born. We are not the ones who do the born, uh, bearing of ourselves. So, Jesus makes that point. In verses uh, 6 to 8, Jesus then goes on to say, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And eventually he's getting to the idea that it's the Holy Spirit of God that gives the new birth, which gives the new ability to trust and, tr and trust in him. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Well, the long and short of this is that we must be born again. It must happen to us. Those who are born of the Spirit by his initiative and work are those who will enter the kingdom of God. Thank you.